My name is Jeff Hoffman, and in this lecture I'm going to cover the topics in biochemistry that you have to know for your Step 1 exam. The first topic is DNA. There's a lot of DNA in a cell. In fact, if you stretch all the DNA from a single cell end to end, it would be about a meter long. Since the cell is only a few microns in diameter, it needs a way of packaging all this DNA into a small space. And it does this by coiling DNA around proteins called histones. Two of each of the histones H2A, H2B, H3, and H4 aggregate together, and DNA wraps around them twice to form a nucleosome. Histone H1 is not part of the nucleosome, but it links them together. The reason that DNA naturally binds histones is because DNA is negatively charged, and histones are rich in the positively charged amino acids arginine and lysine. The lysines on histones are particularly important because gene transcription is often regulated by covalently adding or removing methyl or acetyl groups on these lysines, which can change their affinity for DNA. In general, adding acetyl groups or removing methyl groups decreases the affinity of DNA for histones, which allows it to be more accessible to RNA polymerase and other transcriptional machinery. This is known as euchromatin, which you can see here. In the opposite situation, having more methylation or less acetylation results in a tighter binding of DNA to histones, so it can't be transcribed, and this is known as heterochromatin, which is shown here. I usually remember this difference between acetyl groups and methyl groups by thinking that acetyl groups are bigger and therefore push DNA away from histones, whereas methyl groups are smaller and allow them to stay close together. You can also use the mnemonic shown here, which is that methylation makes DNA mute and acetylation makes DNA active. Methylation can also be used for a different purpose, which is to label the parent strand of DNA during replication. This is useful because if an error occurs during DNA replication, the repair enzymes will be able to distinguish which was the old strand and which is the new one and therefore they can modify the new one to match the old one. Now let's talk about the nucleotides that make up DNA. There are two types of nucleotides, purines, which are adenine and guanine, and pyrimidines, which are cytosine, thymine, and uracil. Uracil is only found in RNA, and thymine is only found in DNA. You can keep purines and pyrimidines straight by using the mnemonic pure as gold and cut the pi. Here you can see the structure of each nucleotide. There's no need to memorize these for your exam, but there are some features you should learn. First of all, the purines have a double ring structure, whereas the pyrimidines have a single ring. You can again use the pi mnemonic to remember this, since pi's have only a single ring. The differences in the locations of ketones and amine groups determine where and how many hydrogen bonds are made when nucleotides pair up in a double helix. Guanine and cytosine pair up by forming three hydrogen bonds, whereas adenine and thymine, or adenine and uracil, form only two. This is important because it's one of the reasons that GC bonds are stronger than AT bonds, which means it requires more energy to separate DNA strands that are rich in Gs and Cs, and therefore they have a higher melting temperature. Can you think of some other properties of DNA that might affect its melting temperature? An important one is DNA length, since shorter strands are easier to separate than longer strands. You should also know which components are used to build nucleotides. Both types are made primarily from amino acids, with purines requiring aspartate, glycine, and glutamate and pyrimidines requiring carbon oil phosphate and aspartate, it just so happens that all the first letters of purine components are A or G, which might help you remember them. One last thing I want to cover here is nomenclature. We've already discussed the names of the bases, but nucleotides are much more than just bases. They also need to have a sugar, which could be ribose or deoxyribose, and a phosphate. If you have just a base and a sugar, that's called a nucleoside. This also affects the names of the specific bases, for example, the nucleoside version of adenine is adenosine, and the nucleotide version of adenine, which also includes a phosphate, is adenosine monophosphate. Next, let's talk about how these purine and pyrimidine bases are synthesized. These pathways can be a little complicated, but they're important to know because some of the steps in these pathways can be targeted by treatments for cancer, since cancer cells need to produce lots of nucleotides in order to replicate. Also, many bacteria have different versions of some of these enzymes, which allows us to target them specifically. First, let's take a look at the chemical structures of purine and pyrimidine precursors. We'll start with PRPP, or phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate. You can already see from looking at it how this might be converted to nucleotide, since as I mentioned in the last slide, a nucleotide is the combination of a base, a ribose, and a phosphate, and we have two of those already here. We'll lose the other two phosphates when we add the base. In the case of purine synthesis, we're going to build a precursor base called hyposanthine onto our PRPP, which results in a nucleotide called IMP, or inosine monophosphate. The amino acids aspartate, glycine, and glutamate provide the materials to make this. From here, modification of functional groups on the base will convert this to AMP by converting this ketone to an amine group, or GMP, by adding an amine group here. That's it for purines, let's move on to pyrimidines. These also use PRPP and also need another precursor called orotic acid, or orotate. Orotic acid is made from a precursor molecule called carbamoyl phosphate. 
and this is covered in one of the later biochemistry lectures. The only thing I want to mention here is that if someone is deficient in the enzyme ornithine transcarbamylase, or OTC, they'll have a buildup of carbamoyl phosphate, which will also increase the amount of erotic acid. Getting back to pyrimidine synthesis, erotic acid is combined with PRPP with the help of an enzyme called orotate phosphoribosyl transferase to produce OMP, or orotidine monophosphate. This is converted to UMP using the enzyme orotidine decarboxylase. I won't go through the details of how this is converted to UDP and CTP, but basically you just add phosphates and make a functional group change. One thing that is important, though, is that so far I've only shown you how to make ribonucleotides, which would be used in RNA. Deoxyribonucleotides, which are used in DNA, are created from these by using the enzyme ribonucleotide reductase, which removes the hydroxyl group from the second carbon, replacing it with just a hydrogen. Since thymidine is only found in DNA and not RNA, ribonucleotide reductase is used along the way. This last step, catalyzed by thymidylate synthase, is especially important for a lot of reasons, including nutrition and pharmacology. As you can see from these structures of uracil and thymine, the only difference between them is this methyl group. A common molecular mechanism for adding methyl groups to molecules uses the coenzyme tetrahydrofolate, which in this case donates the methyl group to uracil to create thymine. After converting this methyl group, tetrahydrofolate becomes dihydrofolate, which requires the enzyme dihydrofolate reductase to cycle back to tetrahydrofolate. Since folate is a key part of tetrahydrofolate, patients who have a deficiency in folate have defects in nucleotide synthesis, which in adults can cause anemia and can also cause neural tube defects in developing fetuses. Dihydrofolate reductase is also targeted by some cancer therapies, such as methotrexate, since cancer cells need to make nucleotides to divide, and also by trimethoprim, which specifically targets a bacterial version of the enzyme to prevent cell division in bacteria. Some other antineoplastic therapies that relate to nucleotide synthesis are hydroxyurea, which inhibits ribonucleotide reductase, 6 mercaptopurine, which inhibits purine synthesis, and 5-fluorouracil, which inhibits thymidylate synthase. As I mentioned a moment ago, erotic acid is an important precursor in pyrimidine synthesis, but let's go over what happens if someone is missing one of the enzymes required to convert it to UMP. This can happen in the case of autosomal recessive mutations in which someone is missing both copies of one of these genes. Since pyrimidine synthesis is the main use for erotic acid, this will cause a buildup of erotic acid, which can be seen in the urine, and that's where the name erotic aciduria comes from. Since this prevents nucleotide synthesis, and therefore cell division, it will cause megaloblastic anemia. Many cases of megaloblastic anemia are caused by deficiencies of vitamin B12 or folate, since these are required for synthesis of thymidine. But in the case of erotic aciduria, supplementation with these vitamins won't help, since the problem is further upstream. It's also important to contrast this with another cause of erotic acid buildup, which is an ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. As I mentioned in the last slide, this enzyme allows carbamyl phosphate to enter the urea cycle so that urea can eventually be excreted, and if it's not functional, carbamyl phosphate will build up and be converted to erotic acid. OTC deficiency can be clinically distinguished from the inability to convert erotic acid to UMP by the hyperammonemia that will occur only in OTC deficiency, since this also prevents excretion of urea. The treatment for erotic aciduria is oral uridine administration, which allows patients to make pyrimidines. Next, let's talk about the purine salvage pathways. This figure shows how all of the purines, their precursors, and the products of their catabolism are converted from one to another. You might recognize that a lot of this overlaps with what I mentioned two slides ago when discussing purine synthesis, such as that hypoxanthine is used to make IMP, which can then be used to make AMP and GMP. Going the other way, when you break down purines, guanine and hypoxanthine are both converted to xanthine, which is then metabolized to uric acid, which is then excreted in the urine. This is a complicated pathway, but I'll focus on a few key enzymes that are associated with diseases. The first is adenosine deaminase, or ADA. In this figure, ADA is represented by the 3 here. It catalyzes the conversion of adenosine to inosine. If ADA is deficient, adenosine begins to accumulate and feeds back to inhibit ribonucleotide reductase, since that's the enzyme that produced it. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, ribonucleotide reductase is required for the synthesis of all deoxyribonucleotides. Since it's inhibited in the case of ADA deficiency, nucleotides can't be produced, which mostly affects cells that need to divide a lot, such as those in the immune system. Therefore, these patients will have severe combined immunodeficiency and a low lymphocyte count. The other important enzyme here is HGPRT, which stands for hypoxanthine guanine physoribosyl transferase, and is represented by the number 1, here and here. HGPRT converts guanine to GMP and hypoxanthine to IMP, so in its absence, guanine and hypoxanthine accumulate and eventually get converted to uric acid. Accumulation of uric acid can directly manifest as hyperuricemia or gout and can indirectly cause an array of neurological problems including mental retardation, 
self-mutilation, which often includes biting, aggression, and chorioathetosis. This is Lashnayan syndrome. HGPRT is on the X chromosome, so this is an X-linked recessive disease. And you can remember that this gene is involved in the purine salvage pathways if you use the mnemonic, he's got purine recovery trouble. How can you treat this? One commonly used drug is allopurinol, which inhibits xanthine oxidase here and here, and will decrease the amount of uric acid in the blood.